Thank you for participating in today's webinar. My name is Lisa White, Membership Services Manager for the Colorado Municipal League. We appreciate you being here today uh, and participating in our webinar on cybersecurity. Those of you who are elected officials who have registered will receive one university training credit today. And the presentation is being recorded and will be posted on our website under cml.org training materials. You can then view that link anytime to review the information that's presented as well as to share it with a colleague who perhaps wasn't able to participate today. If you're not familiar with the webinar format, you'll see a control panel to the top right of the screen. You have an orange arrow to the left of that panel which will minimize the entire box. All participants will be muted for the webinar, but we encourage you to ask questions by typing them into the question box on the control panel. We will address all questions at the end of the presentation. At this point, I'm going to introduce Jack Aerosmith to you. Jack was appointed Executive Director by the Board of Directors for SIPA in February 2015 and has been involved with the organization since its inception. In July 2004, Governor Bill Owens appointed him to the SIPA Board of Directors. He held the position of Chairman of the Board since 2012 with the primary focus to represent local government in Colorado. He graduated with honors from the University of Northern Colorado with a degree in secondary education and a minor in business. Jack's professional career started as a classroom teacher at Englewood High School. Since leaving education in 1980, he has held a number of management positions, including travel insurance and publishing industries. In 2006, Jack was elected to the Office of Clerk and Recorder for Douglas County. Prior to the election, he served as the public trustee to Douglas County for an appointment of four years. I'm going to turn it over to Jack. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Lisa. I appreciate that. We can't thank uh, the Colorado Municipal League enough for our participation and our partnership. As you know, much of my history is with uh, local government, and I have a, a deep love of all aspects of, of local government. What I wanted to do this afternoon is just give you a quick update on some of the initiatives we're looking at for the upcoming year, and then we'll turn it over to Mike Watley to really get to the meat of the topic today in terms of cyber security. But I can say in, in the next 12 months, uh, we're really looking at doing some exciting things at SIPA. We're really gonna get involved in mobile technology and more and more information will come out about how we're moving forward with that. Another initiative we're looking at is developing financial tools, and we think there's going to be some really exciting developments there for municipal government. The whole idea of microprocessing is in the news today, and we are going to get we're going to jump in with both feet in terms of that. Uh, we have some exciting news about our websites. There's going to be some dramatic changes that will happen there um, mm -hmm. in, in the months to come. But related to cybersecurity, I want to remind everybody on the webinar today that we continue to work with our micro grant process. As you may or may not know, every year we award what we call micro grants. Uh, they're about $6,000 each, and they really need uh, to fill some need that a municipality or, or state and local government have. And one of those needs could be related to cybersecurity. Uh, our applications will open up December 1st, so put it on your calendar. We hope we have great number of Municipal League participants in terms of that process. Lisa, I will turn it back to you. Great. Thank you so much, Jack. And as mentioned, CML is a huge supporter of SIPA, wonderful partnership we have, and we certainly encourage all of you to consider utilizing them whenever they can be of assistance. At this point, I'm going to introduce Mike Waitley. Watley? Watley. Mike Watley joined SIPA as the Chief Technology Officer in August 2015. His, responsible, his responsibilities include implementing a technology strategy that supports SIPA's mission of improving digital solutions with cost-saving results. Additional responsibilities include serving as a technology liaison with various stakeholders and contract oversight and negotiation with the vendor community. Mike has a 20-year career in Colorado State Government, serving in senior executive roles at the Office on Information Technology, as well as the Chief Information Officer, both at the Department of Regulatory Agencies and Department of Natural Resources. 
Before Mike's state career, he worked in a variety of research, legal, and federal contract support functions, implementing technology solutions for Bureau of Indian Affairs, U.S. Geological Survey, and the state of Wyoming. Mike has both a BS and an MS from Texas A&M University. So you are in good hands, and we appreciate you being here. I'll turn it over to Mike. Thank you, Lisa. I appreciate uh, that introduction, and, and I'm really glad to be here today. Um, I think you see the first slide up there in the title of our discussion today is considerations from the data center to the boardroom. I, and when knowing that we're talking to a municipal audience, I, you, you could think of that also in terms of the city council room if you want to think in those terms. So, uh, Lisa asked me to come and scare you today. So <laughs> um, I, I'm going to try to tell you a little bit of a story of, about cybersecurity, what it is, uh, who some of the players are, uh, some of the top threats that, that might exist out there, and uh, a few things that you can do to protect yourself. Uh, so with that, let's, let's get started. So let's first, by talking about telling the, the cybersecurity story, I, cybersecurity is a, is a hot topic in the media today. Everywhere you go, you hear about cybersecurity or cyber breaches or something along those lines. But I thought what we should do first is have a definition of what is cybersecurity. And I think the easiest way to get your head around that is it's, it's really about protecting the availability integrity and confidential, uh, confidentiality of data. So as municipal governments, you interact with citizens every day. Much of the data that you deal with in dealing with them is public information. However, there are data elements in your uh, interactions with citizens that may need to be private or confidential. So cybersecurity is really the practice and art, if you will, of keeping those confidential data just as I said, confidential. You know, there's a lot of bad guys out there. Who are the bad guys? We're gonna spend some time talking about who they are and, and we're gonna talk about them categorically because there, there's different motivations out there as to why people uh, act nefariously. <laughs> so one of the, we're gonna talk about some of the fastest growing threats. I'll just give you a little bit of a viewpoint on that. There's, there's this acronym out there called DDOS, a distributed denial of service. It's really an, an aspect where uh, a bad guy, if you will, or a threat actor will purposefully try to interrupt your 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 town's ability to conduct conduct business over the uh, over the internet. And then one topic that we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about is ransomware. I'm sure many of you have heard of ransomware. Uh, the latest uh, issue out there was the WannaCry ransomware um, t um, payload that, that uh, caused a lot of problems. So we're going to talk a little bit about ransomware, what it is, and how you protect yourself about that. And as you know, I mean, given the media scrutiny about uh, how we interact in the world today with the Internet and everything that we do, cybersecurity and cyber threats are a, a really hot topic. But... First of all, let's let's talk about the bad guys. Who are the bad guys? John Chambers is, is the former uh, CEO of a large technology company called Cisco. Many of you have heard of Cisco. They they uh, they manufacture routers. They have a large professional services organization. But but John Ch Chambers a couple of years ago made the statement that there are really only two types of companies in the world those that have been hacked and those that don't yet know that they've been hacked. One of the things that we'll spend a little time talking about today is that many of the threats today you can incur and it may be years before you realize that you've had a problem. Across all industry segments about 96% of 96% of systems are breached and and 27% of those breaches involve something called advanced malware. Well, now's the time to provide another definition. What is malware? Well, malware is what I would call bad software. It's something that, that invades your network, it invades your servers, uh, and it 
and it introduces a lot of risk to your system. There's all sorts of malware and there's all sorts of ways uh, to get malware and we'll talk about that um, uh, in more detail in just a minute. But when you talk about uh, threats and the number of intrusions that may occur uh, against your computer assets in an organization, I'll use the state of Colorado, the executive branch of the state of Colorado as an example. It's one I happen to be familiar with. Um, and the number of unwanted intrusions against the state network today, according to the state CISO, Debbie Blythe, is approaching about 8 million per day. That, that's a lot of bad guys trying to do a lot of bad things. So I will tell you that the, uh, you know, this, the, the data bears out the fact that there's, there's a lot of uh, attempted intrusions. Many of these things are handled automatically in terms of how you resolve them, but uh, there's lots of threat actors out there. Uh, and so let's talk a little bit about where those threat actors may be. And specifically, who are they in, in that context? You know, the, the, the first threat actor that I would talk to you about or potential bad actor is one that you probably don't want to hear about, but it's, it, it, it's one to consider, and that is employees. Now, the vast majority of employees are hardworking, they're diligent, and they mean no harm. However, an employee that has the opportunity to, to be malicious can be malicious. Often malicious employees are ones that are disgruntled. Uh, the vast majority of employees are not malicious. They just may be unaware. So disgruntled employees may car cause harm in a variety of ways. You know, most commonly by corrupting or stealing da data or the intentional introduction of malware. So for those of you uh, that deal with uh, your computers every day, I want you to think about the thumb drives that, that you buy every day at Best Buy or Amazon or whatever. And who, ha who can get those and who can download data from any number of your assets in your town and take data that may be potentially uh, confidential away from, away from your, your work? Uh, so corruption of data, uh, theft of data are important considerations. Um, almost all organizations uh, need to worry about the threat posed by the well-intentioned employee who don't understand cybersecurity practices. So one thing to consider is if in your town you do not have a cybersecurity training program for your employees, one of the things that you should do is to consider that. The vast majority of your workforce is well-intentioned, but if, if they're causing harm because they don't know what the problems are, that, that's a bit of a problem. Now, often that occurs through uh, the introduction of the malware that we talked about previously, and most often that malware is delivered via email or via the internet. So many of you may have heard of a term called phishing, uh, more specifically, spear phishing, where someone may send an email to an employee and they may be spoofing their identity. Uh, a specific example is in June of 2015, uh, a, a company lost $46.7 million through a spear phishing campaign. And the way that was done was a, a a bad guy, if you will, uh, assume the identity of the CEO of a company who sent an email, a specific, very real looking email to the CFO of said company and asked them to make a, a number of financial transactions, which the CFO did. He was getting an email from a CEO. Why wouldn't he do that? And so come to find out, the email that was sent was not from the CEO, it was from someone else. That's an example of something that we call spear phishing. You, you know, if, if you have any questions at all about the, legitimate, the legitimate nature of an email, I would encourage you to pick up the phone and call whoever you, who is, who is supposed to have sent that email and confirm that it's them after all. 
uh, spear phishing is is the way, or or just general emails that get delivered to staff are ways in which malware gets inter introduced. Generally, a good rule of thumb is if you don't know who's sending it to you or you don't recognize the name, I wouldn't click on a link in the email and I probably wouldn't open the attachment. So those are a couple of things to think about. Uh, so the moral of the story on this front is really uh, take the time uh, and make the investment to train staff as needed. The, the next a category of bad guys that I want to talk to you about is something called nation states uh, threat actors. And, and you can really kind of classify this in, in the cyber war, cyber espionage front. I mean, all of us uh, recently have heard about uh, the Russians hacking the election in this country. Uh, there's a lot of fact out there about that. There's also a lot of fiction out there about that. Uh, but it, it seems to be a media darling at this point in terms of discussion. That being said, there are countries in our world today that are known bad guys in the cyber world. And we've already talked about one of them, Russia, North Korea, uh, Iran. Uh, there's many company or countries out there that, that conduct uh, what I would call cyber espionage. And they're constantly probing uh, assets or infrastructure to get a, a competitive edge, uh, to gain information about uh, inf uh, sorts of things. Uh, Iran is a country that is what who we would call the, uh, an up and comer in the cyber uh, world in terms of being a threat actor. Uh, they have done a number uh, of attacks on military, oil and gas, energy and utilities, transportation, airlines, hospitals, uh, to, to gather information, uh, to steal data, and so forth. So you, you have to be really careful with these nation states. Um, our federal government uh, has its own program uh, through Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, and so forth, where they uh, conduct their own sorts of exercises and manage uh, these threats from uh, other companies or countries. You know, a lot of, uh, there, there's this idea of what we call sponsored espionage where hacking tools are, are developed around the globe and sell, uh, sold on the internet. There's, there's a hacking group that, that uh, came out in early summer of two, uh, 2016 called the Shadow Brokers and they published tools uh, that they sold on the dark web. And I'll come back to that in just a second. But uh, the most recent large ransomware uh, attack, the WannaCry ransomware, actually originated from the tools that the shadow brokers uh, group sold on the internet. And what they did is they went onto the dark web and created an auction and sold this these tools that were basically exploitations of the Microsoft operating system. And interestingly enough, uh, the, the origination of those tools were, was our own national security agency here in the United States. Uh, so lots of countries use cyber espionage uh, to, to gain a competitive advantage. Uh, the WannaCry ransomware that, that I referenced earlier was that occurred on May 12th uh, of, of this year, infected over 300,000 systems around the globe, primarily in Europe and Asia. And there's a reason for that. That particular malicious payload infected uh, out of date Microsoft operating systems. And many of those systems that were infected either did not have maintenance or were not patched accordingly. I want you to put that away in your memory. We're going to come back to that in terms of how you protect yourself from ransomware. But uh, it, it was the first, one of the first scenarios where a, a malware essentially went global. And it went global in a hurry because of the particular um, uh, weakness that was uh, found in, in the software. So, 
negligence and pirated software had something to do with the, the, the global impact of that. The other thing that I would have you think about, and for those of you in the IT business who may be on the, on the uh, call today, um, many software companies, uh, I won't mention them by name, ha have a need to bring their product to market as quickly as possible uh, to make money, to, to develop revenue. So uh, sometimes as much diligence uh, that should be done is not done uh, on a finished product of software code. So don't assume just because you buy a piece of software from a reputable company that it's as safe as it should be. You hear about um, uh, problems with a variety of, of commercial software all the time. Another group that I want to talk to you guys about a little bit is, is the, the threat actor, if you will, of organized crime. Now, what, what drives that? that? It's, it's really uh, revenue, right? These guys uh, conduct uh, cyber uh, problems to, to, to make money. And the extortion, and it's, it's, it's the one that most people really identify with, right? There was a data breach, somebody stole data, and what did they do? They turned around and sold that data, whether it be personal information, confidential information, health records, they turn around and sell that on the, the internet, right? So, in fact, um, the the, the sale of health records, there was such a glut of stolen health records in 2015, about 100 million health records were stolen in this country in 2015. And it effectively drove the price of a stolen health record on the internet down from $200 per record to about $100 per record. And so you see companies like Anthem Blue Cross, uh, Premier Blue Cross, Excellus Health Plans, who who had a huge problem uh, with stolen health records that were in their control. Now, how does that, how does that relate to you? Well, in, in this scenario, um, you as a municipality also may have confidential information that you don't own but are stewards of, citizen information. It could be personal identifiable information. It may be health information if you have a health services function. It could be criminal justice information associated with your police department. In those scenarios, as a data steward, you have a responsibility to protect that information and protect the confidentiality of that organization. Because if data can be stolen, it will certainly be sold. Everything from uh, e-commerce accounts, email accounts, social media accounts, Anything that can be stolen will be stolen and sold. Uh, and they all come at, with varying dollar amounts uh, for resale. So there's lots of criminals out there, if you will, uh, that their job is to go out and steal data. Um, there's really a growing trend in this data breach environment where uh, it, there's this new hacking as a service model where, uh, and, and Jack, you can't see this, Jack's across the table laughing at me, but I, I could, if Jack came to me and said, I want you to target this company and I want you to go steal their data and I'm gonna pay you to do that, that's a very real scenario today where uh, entities that may not have the technical ability in which to do that could certainly go out and hire someone to do that on their behalf. So uh, it's, it's kind of a scary scenario. And, and I would encourage you guys also to think just because I'm a small town in Colorado, potentially rural Colorado, that this can happen to me. It can and it does. Um, I, I can tell you firsthand there's many small towns and counties in Colorado that have had data breaches and they have had uh, problems associated with cybersecurity, and, and in talking to those into those organizations, the common theme I find is, well, we're not in the front range. We didn't think this would happen to us. And the reality is, is if you're connected to the internet, regardless of where you are and who you are, it can happen to you. 
So one of the last groups I want to talk about in this con in this uh, context of threat actors are is a group of folks called hacktivists, and that's really kind of an interesting term. It's it's really the com the uh, combination of the word hacking and activist. And hacktivists are organizations that, frankly, they don't particularly care about making the money, but they're driven by a cause. They have a particular ax to grind, a particular thing that interests them. You know, some of the well-known hacktivist groups are anonymous. Many of you have heard of Wiki WikiLeaks. And, you know, hacktivists really started out initially with the idea that we're going to go and deface someone's public website, right? So somebody didn't like the decision uh, a sheriff made, for instance, so they're going to go hack the website and post pornography on that website, as an example. Uh, there's, there's lots of scenarios like that. Uh, Anonymous is, is probably the most well-known uh, hacktivist group. Uh, <laughs> You know they they they've done a lot a lot of things. They uh, in one sense they 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 did something good. They they kind of went to war with ISIS and identified several Twitter accounts that ISIS was using uh, to convey information amongst ISIS members. So they were actually a little bit instrumental in helping uh, the Par Paris Police Department uh, deal with an ISIS attack there, but. Uh, WikiLeaks, we, we're all aware of WikiLeaks, and, and notably their release of 20,000 confidential emails and 8,000 file attachments during the Democratic National Committee on July 22nd. So what happens is these groups, uh, they want to make a point. They have uh, something that they want to say. Uh, they think that government is not uh, transparent enough, perhaps, and they go grab information and they push it out and make it available uh, to everyone. So uh, one of the things, one of the tools that uh, these hacktivist groups use is something called doxing. Now, that, that's kind of an, an interesting term. I think it's a relatively new word, but the the in a verb that, you know, if, you, if you're doxing, what you're doing is you're scouring the internet looking for all the information about something or someone on the internet. And they may post that information in a not so flattering way. So if I wanted to dox, I could go on the internet and look up everything I wanted to know about Lisa White. And please don't. Please don't. Please don't. Yeah, she's she's kind of shaking now. <laughs> uh, and and I, we could post, you know, I could post that information, uh, perhaps in an unflattering way about Lisa. You know, sometimes just your occupation may present a problem, right? So uh, anonymous also was uh, not happy with a decision that the Maricopa County Sheriff made in Arizona, so they went on a kind of a rampage and found out the uh, identities of 7,000 law enforcement individuals in the state of Arizona. State police, sheriff, whatever, many of those individuals were undercover and they posted their identities online. So that's an example of not such a positive action uh, by that scenario. So. You know, I, I don't know if I've scared you enough already, but <laughs> we, you know, we've talked a little bit about what cybersecurity is. We've talked about who some of the threat actors are. Let's talk a little bit now about uh, the actual threat. And, and one, one thing that we should consider is this thing called ransomware. What, what is ransomware? Well, it, it's really a malware that we've talked about previously. And, and it's usually, um, it usually invades your network or your system through an email campaign, or perhaps someone goes to a website and downloads something they shouldn't. Um, but those are generally ways in which uh, that malware or ransomware can be introduced. But as a definition, ransomware is a malware that inhibit, inhibits the operation of your technology assets. 
And it does that by encrypting your data. So I go out via email and click on the wrong attachment or whatever. I download this malware. I don't even know it, right? It, it's transparent to me. And this, the, this, uh, these advanced malwares today have the ability to kind of transverse, if you will, your, your network systems into your storage array and so forth. And, and they do very malicious things in this case. And there are many variants of ransomware. Right, there used to be just six to 10, but there's 60, 70 variants of ransomware today, but they all have a couple of things in common. They either encrypt your data where you cannot unencrypt it, or they stop you, uh, they stop your uh, system from uh, the ability to boot up and start. So it really brings your operation to a standstill, right? Because most of you use your computers every day to do things. So what, what would typically happen in a ransomware attack is this ransomware would occur, would be ingested, the data would be encrypted, and then you would get a notification from the bad guy that says, if you'll pay me uh, $7,000 in Bitcoin, I will give you the ability to unencrypt your data. Now, the real question for you is, do you pay or not? Well, if you talk to the FBI, they say, no, don't pay. I, I know in Colorado here, in a local government scenario, that we've had both scenarios occur where entities paid and, ent and we've had other situations where entities did not pay. In both scenarios, the data were, was still encrypted. Even though, in this case, a county government paid the ransom, their data was still left encrypted. You know, I can't tell you what to do. My general tendency would tell you not to pay the ransom. The ransom is generally paid in something called Bitcoin, which is an unregulated cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency means it's just a currency that occurs on the internet it's not, and it's totally unregulated. So the value of Bitcoin uh, changes pretty dramatically on a day-to-day -day basis. And to give you some idea of, of the impact of ransomware, you know, you see in the second bullet there, ransomware was a billion dollar industry in 2016. In other words, there was a billion dollars worth of um, um, request, if you will, made because of uh, encrypted. And, and the growth has been dramatic. And you, as you see in the third bullet there, from 2015 to 2016, uh, it went from 3.2 million to 638 million uh, in terms of uh, the amount requested um, in terms of uh, ransom there. We already talked a little bit about Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin's kind of a, a fascinating uh, scenario. You can go out and get Bitcoin wallets and Bitcoin currency. Uh, I guess if you get to the point where you have a ransomware attack and, and you feel that you're going to pay that, you can either work with the FBI uh, or, or your other law enforcement officials or your city attorney to advise you on how to, how to approach that. But I have a few other suggestions on, on how to deal with ransomware, and I think we should talk about those now. So this is there's a lot of information on this slide. I, I apologize that it looks a little bit uh, busy, but I, you know we want to talk about prevention and we want to talk about business continuity. In other words, what happens uh, if you do have ransomware? Well, the, first let's focus on prevention strategies and and really the key is and and i've kind of been talking about this uh during the whole session today make sure your employees are aware of ransomware and their critical roles in in, uh, in protecting organizations data train your employees you know don't you know they they need to be aware that if if they get emails or go to websites that may be malicious. Don't, don't download things that they shouldn't be downloading. Don't be opening emails or attachments from 
that, that look strange to you because they probably aren't good. Um, the other thing is for your, for your IT folks in your towns, you know, you should have a, um, a, a robust uh, operating environment where you patch operating systems and update software and firmware on digital devices. It's, it's what we really call having uh, a good cyber hygiene project uh, pro, uh, operation. You know, staying current on patches is, is really important. Make sure that you have antivirus and anti-malware solutions. You know, good security uh, in, in a technology world is multi-layered. In other words, your, your laptops and desktops have uh, malware protection. Your servers have it. Uh, there, there's many layers of protection that, that, you, that you need to install. There's a few other things to consider. You know, you need to manage the use of privileged accounts. Um, you need to make sure that you have adequate access to certain assets and only people, it's what I call role-based uh, access. Not everybody needs access to everything, right? Um, probably the real key with, with uh, ransomware is make sure that you have a current backup of your data, okay? And, and, and secure your backups. If, if, if you were to have a ransomware attack, how much data are you willing to lose? Are you, do you back your data up every day, for instance? So those, those are things to, uh, to, to consider. Um, SIPA has, a, has a, um, a, a vendor that we work with that does cybersecurity assessments, and, and we provide a, a fairly robust uh, process in which we tell people how, how to step through these steps. So, you know, the last, I'm, we're getting close on time and I, I want to get to the last point, which is really this. And, and that is the, the things that, about leadership considerations that your organization, your town should consider about cybersecurity. And, if you get anything at all out of, uh, out of what we're talking about today, this is what I want you to get. So put a little star by this, and that is that the issue of cybersecurity and managing cyber threats is not just a technology issue. It's a business issue. And, and when you look at your town or your city, what is your risk appetite? So if you're a mayor, if you're a city councilman, if you're the IT director, if you're a business program manager within the city, what is your risk appetite? If, if you were to lose all your data, what could you, what could you live with or not? And, and what cost are you willing to pay to manage that risk? Because there is a very definite risk out there. OK, if you have a data breach, if you have a problem, it's not just the technology group in your city that's going to solve the problem. My guess is your city attorney is going to get involved. Potentially your HR department is going to get involved. Your financial people are going to get involved. Uh, it's, it's a multifaceted issue in your city that, that you have to manage. Um, the second point here is there's a difference between security and compliance. There's lots of standards out there about data that, that you need to comply with. If you, you may uh, have health information that you need to manage to the HIPAA compliance standard. You may have CGIS, uh, uh, criminal justice information that you need to manage to CGIS. However, compliance does not equal security. Compliance is a measure of where you are at a point in time. And my example of that is in 2013, Target had, the Target retailer had perhaps the largest breach ever in this country. And 90 days before that breach, they passed a very rigorous PCI compliance point. They were hacked because of a vendor they were working with, not because they didn't pass their compliance test. So don't confuse compliance with security. They're related, but they're not the same thing. And the third bullet is what I just talked about. Cybersecurity is not just an IT issue alone. If you're a city councilman, uh, 
you probably have a fiduciary responsibility to your city that, that you're a part of. As well, if you're in any sort of management in that city organization, you have a fiduciary responsibility. And at the end of the day, managing cyber risk is managing the risk and the fiduciary component associated with managing that risk. This, this next bullet I, I put in there is that uh, Eisner Amper did a study of board of directors of Fortune 50 companies, and I think it's applicable to public sector as well, but they said cybersecurity risk and reputational risk were the two greatest things they were concerned about. And when you look at uh, public sector, I would focus particularly on that second point, reputational risk. Citizens expect government to be transparent, but they also expect government to protect their information. So you have to be very diligent about data that is public, hence the ability to be transparent, and data that is confidential and that you have to protect. You, you have a stewardship responsibility in which to do that. Uh, the third bullet in here about the, the European Union's Data Protection Directorate, I, I put that in there only for this perspective. I want you to understand how big a deal financially this cybersecurity risk is. So the EU in Europe is, is a regulatory body, and they're saying to private corporations, for instance, if we find you negligent, we may be able to fine you up to 5% of your company's global revenue. At what point does this become a big deal for the company? Well, I would suggest to you that it's the same way in the public sector. Maybe not to that point financially, but certainly reputationally. We're at a point in time where I would say citizens have uh, more distrust of, of government than ever before. Therefore, we should be very diligent about protecting data. Uh, and then the last bullet is this, cybersecurity insurance helps but it may not be enough. My recommendation to you is have a conversation with your city attorney. Understand the terms and conditions associated with cybersecurity. Um, in summary, you know, cybersecurity continues to evolve because cyber threats evolve every day. They change rapidly. You know, and cybersecurity is not just a technical issue, it's a business reality. So I, I would tell you, um, don't be scared, you know, anticipate and confront security incidents. And then the, the, this last bullet of identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover, those are all steps in something called the NIST framework put out by the federal government the National Institute of Standards and Technology, they have a very good framework, and in that framework, that they lay out the planning steps. Interestingly enough, the last two steps of that framework are respond and recover, which would tell you, generally, you should anticipate having a problem. The question is, what are you going to do when you have a problem? And so you really should work to have a plan to do that. And CIPA, uh, has a role, I, th I think, in helping you do that. Uh, we partner uh, with local government all over the state. So uh, if you have more specific questions, we're, we're happy to help you try to solve those problems. And with that, I, I think that's the end. Great. My, uh, I think the last, there's the contact information for SIPA. I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. Great. So if you do have any questions, please type them into the question box. Um, I did not tell Mike to scare you. <laughs> I kind of did. I'm but sorry. But he scared the heck out of me, that's for sure. <laughs> I appreciate the information and, and certainly uh, something we all need to be aware of. Um, while the questions come in, again, please type them into the question box if you have any. I uh, want to remind you about our district meetings coming up. Um, CML is going to be traveling around the state in September and October, uh, visiting with our folks all across this beautiful state of Colorado, and we hope you'll join us. Um, the meetings have um, a business portion where we'll talk about the upcoming legislative session, how you can get involved, followed by a social hour and dinner. So we really would love to see you there. 
I'm going to give it another minute uh, for the questions to come in. Nothing so far. You definitely did a great job, Mike. Very Either thorough. that or I scared them completely. Well, you know, completely it could be. Um, another reminder that this webinar is being recorded. We will post the link to the website, cml.org, under training materials. Also, uh, those of you who attended the conference, if you needed to go back and look at some resources that were presented during the sessions, uh, cml.org under annual conference, you'll see everything is posted there. Those of you unable to come to the conference a couple months ago, uh, feel free to go there and check out any sessions that perhaps would be of interest to you. Those materials are available for everyone. All righty then. Well, I don't see any questions, so I certainly want to thank SIPA for their participation and for sharing their tremendous knowledge with us. Um, feel free to reach out to them anytime. Their information is on the screen. Thanks so much, everyone. Hope you have a fantastic uh, afternoon and a great rest of the summer.